how to recognize the benefit of ethics, why good ethics is good business, why having a mindset of, of being an ethical person will really transform everything in our lives, our relationships, our jobs, our productivity, our organizations, our communities. The quality of life is so much better when we all develop an ethical mindset. I've actually never met anyone who teaches business ethics. Jonas's story is fascinating because when he was a young man, he traveled the length and breadth of the United States, trying to discover what it is that he really wanted to do. It's taken him a while, but I think he's finally on a wonderful mission of teaching corporations and individuals how to do business with ethics. He has a term which I've never come across, which is ethical aff affluence, not influence, affluence. It's a wonderful story, a wonderful journey. I know you're going to really enjoy it. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Jonasen. How are you today? I'm doing well. It's uh, sunny here, which is a nice change for us. So uh, it's bright and cheery. Oh, brilliant. Well, I'm in the UK and we had actually in February really unseasonable warm weather. And uh, but now we're back to normal and it's pouring with rain. <laughs> 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 so um, actually, we saw on the news uh, recently there was some I don't know how close you are to these, but there's some bad kind of tornadoes going off in the USA and somewhere. Oh, yeah. Um, in Alabama and Georgia, it's terrible. Yeah, that was really sad. So many people, you know, were hurt and, and perished. And that's that's dreadful to hear. Um, but yeah, the, the weather in the in the US, from my memories from traveling there, always has been you know, can be really violent. I'm, I, once I was in the Boston area. Yeah, it was Boston. <laughs> and they had a, like, one of these snow hail storms. And there was, like, hail stuck to trees. You know, like, oh, it was just incredible. I'd never seen anything like it. It was really quite scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, I'm, I'm super interested in hearing your story because it sounds fascinating. And um, I ask a, an opening question of everybody to kind of get us going. And that is, if you could tell us a little bit about your personal life. So let's go right to the beginning. So where were you born? And then, you know, what about schooling and education? Have you moved around? Where do you now live? Obviously, we'll go into that a little bit. And then, you know, what happened in terms of work after your education? What did you do after that? And we'll just take it from there. And I know we're going to be going on a magical mystery tour. So over to you, Jonasen. All right. Well, I grew up in uh, Los Angeles, California. You, you may have heard of California. It's slightly west of the United States. Yes. Um, Very famous. And it, <laughs> And, and, yeah, and in fact, when I when I traveled uh, through through Britain, through Europe, uh, really around the world, when people would say, "Where are you from?" I never answered the United States because that just elicits yawns. Mm. I always said California. Yes, and and people's eyes would get wide, and they'd say, "Really?" Sometimes they'd say, "You don't look like it." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. <laughs> So it's a good place to be from. Uh, yes. I, I, I lived there till, till I was uh, I finished high school. And then I was very eager to get out of Los Angeles, the, the city of glitter and glitz and, and not much substance. Uh, I went up to the northern part of the state, hmm. which in many ways is like a different planet. Uh, it's very rural. It's very conservative. And I studied at the University of California. Um, and then I embarked on a series of, of travels that eventually led me to Israel. I lived in Israel for nine years, and uh, when I finished there, my wife and I moved to Budapest, Hungary, to teach high school. We moved from there to Atlanta, Georgia, and then to St. Louis, where we've been for 23 years. Wow. So you have moved around quite a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. When our, when our oldest daughter was, 
was, I think, uh, four or five. Her favorite game was was moving. She would put all of her toys into shopping bags and carry them around the house. We thought, oh, my God, we, we need to we need to settle down. This is not healthy. <laughs> well, they do say that. I mean, I moved around quite a bit when I was younger. I'm a bit more settled now, but they do say it kind of moving around, especially moving to different countries, it just gives you a different perspective on the world and life and, and human nature. Oh, that's definitely true. Uh, here, here, here in uh, central Missouri, my, uh, my wife works with a number of people in the school system that have never, some of them have never been out of, out of the state, uh, and most of them have never been out of the country. And as you say, it's important to develop our worldview. We need to meet people from different places, talk to people with, from different different backgrounds and, and orientations and cultures, because that's how we grow and that's how we broaden our perspective. Mm. So obviously, the furthest you traveled there when you were talking about where you'd moved around was Israel. And so what what took you there? Well, that's, that's really where the... Uh, the heart of the story lies. Uh, when I was, I was in my last year at the University of California, and I was studying English, and I loved studying English. Uh, in fact, I claim to be one of the few Americans who can actually speak it. But the um, you know the texture of language and the drama of stories unfolding and the and the exposure to new ideas. But the the problem with with studying English is the perennial question that so many college seniors worry and fear is, what are you going to do when you graduate? And as I was getting closer and closer to graduation, I had no idea what I was going to do when I graduated. Right. But that specter is on the horizon. It's getting closer and closer. And, and an idea started to formulate in my mind until it crystallized. And then I knew what I was going to do. The first hurdle was going to be telling my parents. Right. So especially when they called me up and they told me, we're so proud of you. We've decided that as a gradu- graduation present, we are going to buy you a new car. Mm. And I paused and I said, Mom, Dad, thank you so much. That's so nice of you, but I don't want a new car. Mm. You see, I've decided that after I graduate, I'm going hitchhiking across the United States. Wow. <laughs> well, that's, that's not exactly how they responded. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so it, it took us some time to, um, you know, uh, it took them some time to adjust to that idea. And then my mother called me up and she said, please, please take a train, at least for the first part of your trip. I don't want to find out that you were murdered two miles from home. Of course. Well, I'm still not sure what the difference between being murdered two miles or 2000 miles from home is, but <laughs> that is May. Um, so I took a train from Southern California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I didn't get a seat on the train. It was filled with Japanese high school students on the way to the Grand Canyon. Oh so I had to God. sleep in the dining car, which might have been comfortable for dining, but wasn't very comfortable for sleeping. No. I didn't sleep much. And when I got off the train in Albuquerque the next afternoon, I was tired and I was cranky. And I was just looking forward to finding some pleasant company in the comfortable bed at the local youth hostel. Mm-hmm. So I followed the directions in my youth hostel guide, walked about eight blocks, came to the address, and there I found a donut shop. <laughs> so I had to go clear across town, find my way to the campground of America, paid for a little site, and there I'm surrounded by RVs and Winnebago's and aluminum campers, and I pitched my little pup tent. And it's a clear, beautiful night. The air is absolutely still. It's already starting to get dark, and I told myself, get to bed early, get a good night's rest, yeah. you'll wake up in the morning, you'll start your great adventure. So I settled in my sleeping bag and I thought, I'll fall asleep quickly. I didn't sleep on the train. It took me a while, but I finally drifted off. And then what seemed like hours later, I woke with a start. The wind had kicked up to gale force. Oh, no. And <laughs> because the air had been so still when I'd gone to sleep, I had neglected to stake out the corners of my tent, which was now threatening to buckle in the wind. Oh, God. So I had to get out of my sleeping bag, get dressed go out into the cold night air, stake out the tent, come back inside, get undressed, get back in my sleeping bag. I looked at my watch. It was 9.30 p.m. (laughs) (laughs) 
hadn't had that, that much sleep yet then. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, you know, it proceeded to be a long, uncomfortable and pleasant sleepless night. When the sun came up in the morning, I was not filled with the spirit of adventure and the thrill of the open road. Mm. I was filled with terror. Yeah. The world had gotten a lot bigger, a lot scarier. And that voice in my head was now saying, what were you thinking? How did you ever come up with this crazy idea? You know what you need to do? You need to get right back on that train and go straight home. Wow. And there are two things that stopped me. First, I had told everyone I knew what I was going to be doing. And when I contemplated slinking home with my tail between my legs and confessing that I'd given up, chickened out after one day, I couldn't imagine anything that could happen to me on the road that would be worse than that humiliation. That's right. But more significantly, I, I heard another voice in my head, and this was softer, but just as persistent. It was saying, you are standing at a crossroads, and you have a choice to make between doing what you feel like doing and doing what you know you ought to do. And the choice you make right here and right now could change the course of your life forever, which it did. And I'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> so I got my stuff together and, and I thought, you know, what would make this so much easier is if I could just see a friendly face. So I decided instead of going east as I planned, I decided I'd go up north to Colorado. I had a friend in Boulder. And I figured I'd uh, you know, see, see my friend. I hung out there for about a week. I it was, it was winter time already. And I figured I have just enough time to get in and out before the bad weather sets in. Mm. I miscalculated by one day. And I ended up hitchhiking out of Denver in a snowstorm. Oh, my God. Now, you'd think if you're hitching in bad weather, people would feel sorry for you. But it doesn't work that way. They might feel sorry, but they don't want to get the inside of their cars wet. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's incredible because we started this interview talking about the weather. And, <laughs> and there yeah, you there are, <laughs> all this violent weather that you're getting on your journey. <laughs> yeah, it's just the first week, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, the um, I forget who said it. Someone said, if not for the weather, most people would have nothing to talk about. <laughs> That's right. And in this case, it really, it really, it was really providential because it guided the whole course of my trip. I ended up, it took me three hours to get a ride standing in the snow in Denver. I finally got picked up by a Yugoslavian Seventh Day Adventist. Um, nice fellow, but he loved to, he loved to chat. He loved to talk. In fact, he talked so much, he ran us out of gas uh, about 15 <laughs> miles out of Santa Fe. Uh, but we got there. But I was so cold. With this cold front moving in, I just I just kept going south. And I kept going south until I couldn't go south any farther. I ended up in Key West, Florida, the southernmost point in the continental United States. And I decided that I would stay there for uh, the winter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know, it warmed up a little bit. I could continue my trip. Problem was, I didn't have a lot of cash. I needed to find a job. And working at Burger King just didn't seem like it was consistent with the with the swashbuckling or Jack Kerouac persona I was trying to cultivate. So I was looking for something a little more, little more consistent, a little more uh, interesting. And I was chatting with a fellow at a bus stop, and he told me that he'd just gotten off a job working on a, on a shrimp boat. And I said, how do you get a job like that? He said, it's easy. He said, boats are going in and out all the time. Just ask around, you find a job. I said, great. So I started asking around. And every person I asked, gave me exactly the same answer. Yeah, it's easy. Just ask around. And the more <laughs> I asked around, the more people told me to ask around. Oh, my God. So I finally went into the tackle shop. And there's this, uh, this crusty old uh, salt behind the counter. I said, can you help me? I want to get a job on a boat. Everybody says ask around. I keep asking around, and that's the only answer I get. This fellow looks at me, leans forward, spreads out his hand. He says, so ask around. <laughs> <laughs> so the next morning i said i'm going to go down to the water line i'm going to walk and ask every single person i see at least until i get a different answer sure first guy i come to middle-aged man wearing a 
windbreaker, uh, fiddling with some kind of uh, little navigational piece of machinery. And I said, excuse me, I'm interested in getting a job on a boat. Can you give me some advice? He looked at me, looked me up and down, didn't say a word, turned his back on me, went over to the nearest boat. And he said, he called into the boat. He said, hey, Joe. And a voice inside answered, yeah. You going out tomorrow? Yeah. You still need a guy? Yeah. I got a guy for you. Good. <laughs> he comes back to me. He says, can you swim? <laughs> I said, yeah, and I don't get seasick. He said, that's it. Come back tomorrow morning. Brilliant. I, said, okay. I didn't know what I was going to be doing. I didn't know the job. I didn't know how long. I didn't know the pay. It didn't matter. Nope. <laughs> okay. So let me tell you about this job. You might be aware, or maybe not, that Key West, Florida is one of the most heavily trafficked routes for illegal for illegal drugs coming into the United States. Yeah, I bet. So the Coast Guard knows this also. And they catch a lot of boats coming in. And if they catch drugs on the boat, so they impound the boat pending trial. If the person is acquitted, he gets his boat back. If he's found guilty, they sell it at public auction. But in the meantime, they need some place to put these boats. Yeah. And the custom docks are up in northern Florida, several hundred miles away. So the fellow that I happened to come up to that morning, he owned a company that contracted with the Coast Guard to transport boats seized for drug trafficking from Key West up to the northern part of the state in the customs docks. Wow. And it worked like this. They would take two boats at a time. They had three sailors on the lead boat, and that boat would tow a second boat. Mm hmm my job was to ride in the second boat, the one being towed. Mm. And I can't overstate the importance of this job. My job was that if through some mishap, the boat I was on would start to sink, my job was to cut the rope. <laughs> so it wouldn't pull the other boat down with it. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a scary job, right? <laughs> Well, it depends. <laughs> there, there, there was a, a there, there, the first boat was a little a little leaky. I had a pump that I had to run every few hours, but uh, you know, for this, I got paid forty five dollars a day. I, I got food. I, I I slept on the boat, and uh, yes, it was it was Florida. I laid out in the sun and uh, and read books, and it was very pleasant. And when I got up there, the boss said, "You want to go again?" I said, "Sure." Mm -hmm. So. We drove back down to, to Key West in the back of a U-Haul truck. And a few days later, showed up again. This time, I didn't have this rickety old boat. I had a quarter of a million dollar racing yacht. Wow. I mean, this was the lap of luxury. Comfortable seats, beautiful interior. I mean, it was gorgeous. Yeah. So, took another trip up. And when we got there, there's another pair of boats going with us. We went to two boats in tandem with two other boats. And uh, they got there early. We got there late. And so they'd taken the truck back to Key West. So the boss said, well, I'll send you back to Key West on a Greyhound. But then he thought twice about it. He called up a travel agent. And he found it would be the same price to fly as to take Greyhound. So he said, you might as well fly. I said, fine with me. Mm-hmm. So he put me on one of these little commu commuter planes that holds, I don't forget, seven or nine people. And there was only one other passenger on the plane. Mm -hmm. So we're taxiing on the runway. We lift off. And I, and I think to myself, you know, I just sailed up the coast of Florida in this luxury yacht. And now I'm flying back in practically my own private plane. Mm -hmm. Maybe this English degree is working out pretty well after all. It's pretty good so far. <laughs> well, while I was in Key West, I decided, you know, this has been great, but I've had just about enough. I'm going to finish this trip. I wanted to go up to the East Coast to Washington, D.C. Right. So when I, when I get done, I called my mother. I said, you know, I'm going to finish my trip. Then I'm coming home and it's time to think about growing up. What am I going to do with my life? Uh, looking to getting a job, maybe go back to graduate school. 
Of course, my mother was overjoyed with this. So yes. a few weeks later, I call her up again and she says, you know, something came in the mail. And it was a it was a form for a college program at the University of London for a summer. Right. And she and she said, I'm so happy you're coming back and going to be a normal person. I want to give you this 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 uh, trip, this 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 uh, program as a present. And I said, you know, thanks, mom. I'm really not interested. I've had enough traveling. I just want to settle down. I've had you know, plenty of school. Thanks, but no thanks. Yeah. Well, a few weeks later, I call up and my mother says, have you thought any more about that program in London? I said, no. She said, well, I signed you up for it anyway. Wow. I said, well, thanks, but I'm still not interested. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents are so thoughtful. <laughs> well, you know, when you when when you've been driving them crazy for a long time, they you know, any sign of sanity uh, <laughs> kicks in those those parental uh, impulses. That's uh, right. Yeah. So uh, uh, she said, "Well, think about it." I said, "Fine." And as it turned out, I thought about it. I said, you know, not such a bad idea. Go to go to go to Great Britain. Uh, sort of transition me back into a more collegiate mindset or professional mindset. So, okay, I'll take the trip. But then as I thought about it more, I said, you know, it seems such a shame to just go for four weeks and come back. Yeah. To be in, to be in England and not see the country, to be close to Europe and not see the continent, you know, it just doesn't seem to make any sense. So, well, maybe, uh, after the program, I'll, I'll take a backpack and I'll, I'll see some of uh, Britain, some of Europe. Right. And then I thought, well, you know, I'd really like to, to see more exotic parts of the world too. I'd like to see Asia. And, um, and you know, they say Africa is the, the last unspoiled continent. And of course, every American wants to visit Australia. So this four week plan in my mind, develop into this two-year open-ended trip around the world. Mm -hmm. Of course, my mother at that point regretted that she'd ever made this offer in the first of place. Of course, yeah, yeah. Because um, you follow it, you were going to follow the same route as you did previously, which is traveling in yeah. places where she wouldn't, know, she doesn't know whether you would be safe or not. I, she thought by just sending you to London to a place, you'd be there and then come back again. And of course, the 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 gypsy in you, the traveler in you, the explorer in you wants to do more, you know, and go, well, if I'm there, why don't I do some more exploration? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, from a theological point of view, which is my orientation these days, um, you know, our, we, we have a soul that is yearning to connect to something higher. Mm. And, and that's why so many of us have this restlessness. Yeah. You know, we want to travel. We want to go to other places. Then we get to other places. We want to come home. We, we're homesick. Mm. Or, or we're, we're, in one, we're in a trip. How many people do this? They, they're on a trip, and they spend the whole trip thinking about the next place they're going to be. Yeah, yeah. And they don't experience what they're doing because they're always that's thinking right. the ne next step ahead. And you, you miss so much. But it's, it's that... That that spiritual yearning for connection to something greater than ourselves, something that, that we're having trouble finding. And, and, and I believe that's what was driving me. Uh, well, the beginning of my plan worked pretty much as I planned. I, I had this very nice program in London. I, I, I traveled throughout Britain and up to Scotland and, and, and around the, the, the continent and uh, hit most of the countries of Western Europe. Yeah, and, uh, amazing. And then, yeah, it was, it was you know, it was... It was, it was lovely. It was, you know, there, there's, you ever hear the expression, I just learned this recently, there's an expression, something called decision fatigue, mm -hmm. where you have to keep making choices. And the more choices we make, the more we exhaust our choice making muscle. Yes. Uh, it's why, it's why people in like politicians and, and businessmen, they get into these horrible scandals because the, all day, every day, it's high stakes decisions and they get so worn out that then when they get confronted with something that should be obvious that's going to destroy their lives they have no no resilience left to to make the right choice and resist uh, temptation mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so the, i really felt that i remember this vividly i was i was walking down the streets of vienna 
And I came to a, an intersection. Vienna is a beautiful city. I mean, it's just stunning. Um, and I was just walking around looking. And I got to a street corner and I couldn't make up my mind which way to go, right or left. And it didn't matter because I wasn't going anywhere. I was yeah. just walking around. But I literally stood there. I don't know. It could have been five or ten minutes incapable of deciding which way to turn. Right. And I said to myself, this is ridiculous. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not getting anything out of this anymore. I'm just saturated with impressions. I need to find some place to just settle down for a bit, stop moving, recharge my emotional batteries, and, and then I can go on again. So um, I worked my way south. When I got to Greece, I got a plane to Israel. And in Israel, you may have heard, they have, they have something called kibbutzim. Yes. Uh, a kibbutz is a collective farm. And the collective farms take volunteers to work on them. They're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is. So, you know, you, they, they get free labor. People get a free experience. They get room and board. Uh, they get to learn part of the culture. So mm -hmm. I figured a couple of months picking oranges and grapefruits, uh, get my head together, and then I'll head off again, this time to... Uh, you know, Kenya and Botswana. Well, that year, the United States dollar was at an all-time high. And there were 9 million Americans in Europe. And of course, when it starts to get cold, many of them drain south into the Mediterranean. Right. And so when I showed up at the kibbutz placement office, I discovered a phenomenon that was unheard of. In, in anybody's memory, they didn't have any place for volunteers. There were people wow. camped out in sleeping bags like they were wanted to buy tickets to a rock concert. Yeah, and, and this doesn't sound good. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was, you know, signs up saying, come back next year. Right? This is November. Um, and what am I going to do? I don't, I don't have money to just hang out. Um, and the whole point is to get some structure to my life. Yes. Well. Through a, an unlikely series of events, I ended up in a rabbinic college. Now, what, is, what are one of those? Well, it's a it's called a yeshiva. It's a place where they study um, the traditions of Judaism, the Old Got Testament, you. the Talmud, the, the 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 ancient laws and, and and ethics of Jewish tradition. Right and. You know, I, I grew up Jewish. I had no, no religious orientation whatsoever, no training. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew nothing about it. But I knew I was Jewish. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, the opportunity presented myself, presented itself. And I had no intention. I was going to become a rabbi or become religious. It was just, it was, a, it was interesting. It kept my mind engaged. They gave me a bed and three meals a day. And, um, you know, why not? I can do this for a couple of months. Might end up being more interesting than picking oranges. Sure. Well, you know, they say uh, man, man plans and God laughs. Uh, yes. I, I had this great trip planned out, but I discovered, um, well, I'll tell you, the first day I got there, um, they bring me into a classroom and they say, there's going to be a Jewish philosophy class in a few minutes. Make yourself comfortable. So it was really cold. It was it was it was Jerusalem, which is in the mountains. It was it was uh, November, December, and um, the heat wasn't working properly, and I was shivering. And in the far back corner of the room, there was one chair where a, a shaft of sunlight was coming through the window onto this one chair. And so I went over there, I sat down in the far back corner. And I waited. While I waited, the whole room filled up around me, absolutely packed. There wasn't a there wasn't an empty inch of room in this in this in this space. And then the instructor walks in, and everybody stands up, and I look for a way out, <laughs> because this ins this instructor he is not just a rabbi, he's Hasidic. So imagine the look the long black coat and the big black hat and the scraggly beard and the side locks and the glasses with Coke bottle lenses. lenses and I know what's going to happen. You know, he's going to look at us. He's going to have the thick accent. He goes, you're all going to burn in hell if you don't do what I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and did I said, he? Well, I, I said, I said, I, I got to get out of here. I can't listen to this. No. But 
I was in the far back corner of the room that was packed. I would have had to literally climb over a dozen people to get out of there. I would have been a spectacle of myself. It wasn't going to happen. No. I slid back in my chair. I said, I can survive anything for an hour. And then he starts to talk. And he has an accent, but it's not, it's not European. It's, it's New England. Right. And he's, he's so articulate and he's so eloquent and he's so rational and so knowledgeable. And, and he sounds like he could be a professor from Johns Hopkins University, which I found out later he was. <laughs> and, and by the end of that hour, I thought, wow, this is not what I expected. There's something going on here and I've got to figure it out. And so I stayed. I came back the next day and the next day. And, and there were a couple of other guys there. And, and together, we peppered him with questions and challenges and objections and arguments. Sure. Until after a couple of months, he'd answered all my questions and he'd refuted all my arguments and he'd responded to all my objections. And I kind of ran out of excuses. <laughs> I had, to, I had to, to ask myself, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to reject everything he says because you don't like the way it makes you feel? Or are you going to change your whole way of looking at the world? And it was, uh, it was agonizing reappraisal. I mean, here I was. I'd been to college. I'd traveled the world. I was 24 years old. I had life all figured out. Of course you did. I knew it all. And now I'm being told, you don't know anything. You have to go back to square one. Before square one. You're not even up to square one. Yeah. And uh, it, really, it really took a, a tremendous amount of soul searching, literally. Um, and, and may I, I decided, ask, how absolutely. old were you then? I was 24. That's so interesting. Do you know why? Why I was 24? No, do you know why <laughs> oh, it's why so interesting, interesting that me. you were 24? Because you know what happens to the frontal lobe in our brain uh, yeah. by the yeah. age of 25? Yeah. Uh huh. So you were, our, it's when we get to 25 is when our frontal lobe is fully developed. And we, yes. the, they call it the executive, don't they? The frontal lobe right, right. of our brain. And it's the part of the brain where we make more rational decisions in terms of our life and we were talking about decision making earlier and you you were obviously on that you know in that part of your brain was ready to receive some of this information and you were ready and able to make sense of it in a rational way where perhaps previously you wouldn't have been if you were any younger you probably would have dismissed it and gone oh, well, at least I had somewhere to stay and I got food, you know, time to move on to the next adventure. Yeah, thank you for that. I never made that connection, which was surprising to me. As I actually, I was briefly, briefly exposed to it when I was 21. Mm. And I thought, wow, this is really something interesting, but I never followed it up. Mm. So you're absolutely right. And of course, if it would have been farther on in life, you know, once, once we're committed, we have families, we have careers, it's yes. much harder to make those kinds of changes. So right. it really was, yeah, as you say, it was, it was really uh, the, the, the providential timing of everything. Mm, uh, absolutely. Was, was remarkable. And, and, you, and, you, and you talk, yeah. I and mean, I'm sure we're going to get into that if we have time, but I mean, you talk a lot about wisdom. So in, in some of your writing, I can see the word wisdom popping up. And obviously you, at some level, you know, received the wisdom from that gentleman and, and you went, yes, this is the wisdom that I've been looking for. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, as I said before, you know, we're, we're, most of us are searching. We can, we can suppress that desire to connect. Uh, we can distract ourselves, as many people do, with, with whatever pleasures the material world has to offer. Mm. Um, we can aspire to material goals, which uh, look very attractive before we get them and, and can make us comfortable if we attain them. 
but tend not to not to fulfill us. You know, there are a lot of really unhappy rich people in the world. Well, I, I'm just. Just to interject there, I was listening, there's a podcast I listen to regularly um, by, hosted by Cara Swisher, who's in Silicon Valley called Rico Decode. And she was interviewing um, a very successful billionaire who, his name is, I've never heard of him before. And he used to be with Facebook and he's done, he's got like one of these venture capitalists companies now um but he's renamed it now and he's called it social capital anyway he went on a very deep dark journey himself and his name is chamath palahapitaya something like that anyway mm. chamath he's known at as as, as and, and he's this and he was on this podcast and he was talking about his search for happiness and identity crisis that happened to him. You know, he had all the money in the world, billions, and he was deeply unhappy. He says he's getting there, he's he's developing, you know, coming back and, and discovering happiness, but he's not there yet. And you know, and I'm sure we're going to get into that in a little bit further, but you you're so right in that. People are searching for things and they think that oh, let's get all the money in the world and then I will be happy. And of course, it doesn't happen that way at all. No, I mean, you know, money is like most things in this world. It's a resource. And the more you have, the more you can do. Yes. But the question is, what are you going to do? Yes. And, and you know, the, the, the shiny toys and, and, the, and the fancy cars and the big houses and the, and the pretty girls and, and the clubs and the, and the sports. And the, I mean, you know, these are distractions. Mm. You know, it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a whole different conversation from the one we're having, but you know, in, in, in America, we have this ringing phrase from our declaration, declaration of independence, the, the pursuit of happiness. And most people, if you ask them to define happiness, they'll give you an answer like, well, you know, <laughs> if, if you don't know what is, what something is, how can you pursue it? Mm. Mm. And the, and the source of happiness is something that comes from very deep inside. It, it's really, again, it's that connection to something greater than ourselves. When you look at these 12-step programs, the first step is acknowledge there's something greater than yourself. Mm. Because if I'm all there is, then what am I? I'm here for a few decades, grab as much pleasure as I can, and then I'm gone. Yeah. Uh, what does it all mean? <laughs> but if I'm connected to a to, into a family, to a community, to a, to a society, to a, to a world, uh, to a higher power, um, then my contribution is something that is enduring and internal. And that becomes a source of tremendous joy. Yeah. And, I mean, I've, we've studied, my wife and I have been studying happiness for the last few years. And listening to different audiobooks and teachings and and I, I i i'm not suggesting this is i came up with this because it just happened to come out of different things that i was listening to but i did come up with like a bit of a equation or a formula for happiness and that was that and it's nothing magical it's just that most of us are in suffering for one reason or another. And for me, the absence of suffering is the first step towards happiness. But then what is the origin of suffering? And I heard somebody else mention this on an interview. And this lady was actually the CEO of the International Coaching Federation in New York. And she was unfortunately, um, very ill with cancer. And she said one wish for the world that she had was that there was less fear and doubt. So I went, oh, my God, that's it. You know, fear and doubt is the, is the origin of suffering. So fear and doubt equals suffering, and the absence of that 
can lead to happiness. That's very interesting. Uh, I, I would suggest maybe tweak that a little bit. Please, um, please. Because that's what you, what you said is, is about the, the, this, this woman and her, her comment is very, very consistent with uh, the teachings of Jewish uh, philosophy. We have a, a phrase that says, the only true happiness comes from the resolution of doubt. Yeah. And it goes back to that idea of purpose. If I have a sense of why I'm here and why my life's important, and, and then I feel that I'm working towards the fulfillment of the purpose of my existence, that becomes a source of joy. If I'm flailing around or uncertain or think that my efforts are not uh, worthwhile, that is the source of, of, of pain and, and depression. Now, as far as suffering goes, um, we, have, we, we have a common phrase. I'm sure you have it as well. No pain, no gain. Mm. Uh, and, and we usually apply it to the gym. Uh, yeah. If, if you pick up weights that are easy, you don't build muscle. If you push yourself and, and you do things that really hurt and really stretch, stretch you, then you grow, even mm. though you're going to be in pain. So the, it's not, we, we can handle suffering. What we can't handle is suffering that we think is for no reason. Yeah. You know, a woman going through labor, um, you know, women will repeatedly put themselves in this in the position of having to go through labor. Yes. Even when they know what it feels like, mm. or they know what to expect, and and they, you know, they deal with it because the benefit that comes from that pain is so evident that they don't mind. It's not pleasant. They don't like it, but they deal with it. It's yeah. when we think that our suffering has no purpose. That's when we can't handle it. Senseless, pointless pain is intolerable. Mm. And so when we have a sense of purpose, that gives us joy. And that's what enables us to, to work through the pain, to endure the suffering, to feel joy even in times of suffering when we recognize that the suffering is really something that's helping us grow. You know, Khalil Gibran said, your, your pain is the breaking through the shell of your understanding. Yeah. When you, when you come to a new level of awareness, and, and it's like my story of, of having to, to face this prospect that I now have to reevaluate my whole world view and, and, and start over from scratch. I mean, that was, that was painful. I bet. But, you know, it gave me a whole life I never would have imagined. And, and it's a life that has also had pain in it. Mm. Um, but I have a context to make sense of that pain. Yeah. And that's why pain and, and pain and joy do not have to be mutually exclusive. You can, mm -hmm. they can coexist. And pain and joy is what makes the pain bearable. Yeah. I understand. Thank you for that. And then, so once you had that awareness and realization, what, what happened after that? Well, then came the long job of catching up. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, Jewish education is is something that that we do. We spend our lives doing. Um, the the Talmud is the is the record of the oral law and the oral tradition. It's written in a combination of Hebrew and ancient Aramaic. Aramaic is a blend of of Hebrew and, and Babylonian, mm -hmm. and it's it's written in a form. That you can't just open up and skim through it, even if you have translation. Mustard doesn't make any sense. There no, there's no punctuation, um, there are no vowels. It's it's really meant to be a guide to to oral learning, to face to face learning, and there are um, two thousand seven hundred and eleven folios, which is fifty four hundred twenty two pages in the Talmud, and uh, believe me, I haven't seen most of them. Uh, no. uh, and there are commentaries and there are laws and, and it's all different facets of this tremendous body of, of wisdom. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's a guidebook for life. And so I stayed in Israel for the next nine years studying. Uh, and I, I eventually got my rabbinic ordination. I uh, got married. My wife and I had our first two children there. And uh, it was interesting because one day, my, my rabbi came up to me, sort of out of the blue, and he said, you know, 
there's going to come a point where you're not going to be satisfied to just sit here and study. Yeah. And I looked at him like it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing else I wanted to do. It was, this was just so fulfilling. It was so rewarding. It was so engaging. There was so much to catch up on. Yes. But this is why we all need a mentor, somebody who knows us better than we know ourselves, uh, to guide us. And even though there are many people who will stay in the, in the bubble, if you will, or in the ivory tower, uh, and that's great. But I started feeling a while later, I don't know, maybe it was a year or two later, I started feeling this restlessness again, that I'm just not fulfilled, uh, absorbing. I want to start giving. And so yeah. I entered a training, I entered a training program um, to become a teacher. And, uh, and my wife and I, we, uh, we took a first job in, in Hungary. The, the Iron Curtain had come down four years earlier, and a new Jewish school had opened up teaching Jewish tradition to teenagers who had been deprived any knowledge of their Jewish heritage. Right. Uh, so that was a little different, <laughs> a little different culture. And, and would they study in English or? Well, so that was interesting that what the school had done since, since there really were no or few um, teachers of, of Jewish subjects who, who were fluent in Hungarian, hmm. they, they started this school and the, and the draw of the school, there were actually two draws. Um, one is it taught English. And right. under the Soviet system, the only languages Hungarians were allowed to learn were Hungarian and Russian. Mm -hmm. Because what better way do you keep people from wanting to go elsewhere if, than, than preventing them from being able to communicate with anybody else in the world? That's right. So the school offered an intensive English program, and that was very attractive. And it also offered um, free meals to the students. And so, uh, you know, and again, under the Soviet system, people did not have expendable income. Mm. It was it was very, very tough to get by. Things were subsidized, but you didn't have anything extra. So uh, the first year the school was in existence, they had a full year intensive English program. And the students who had been there for that part of the program, they were all conversant. Right. Some but, of the students that hadn't had that advantage, it was more con it was more challenging because they, their English skills were not good at all. But how did you find out about it? I mean, it's a very unlikely country to go to from Israel. Oh yeah, of course. Uh, no, there the, the 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 teaching training program I was in. Um, somebody came and presented this, and said they're looking for teachers. Right, got you. Okay. And so, you know, a new teacher has a rough time. Mm. You, have, you have to take positions that nobody else wants. Uh, you, you have to go places you may not want to go. That's right. And, you know, I, I, I was offered a job, for instance, in San Antonio, Texas, which would have barely been enough to live on and, um, you know, would have been in this, this out of the way place in this mixed school that, uh, wasn't exactly what I was hoping for. Hungary, they could pay us an American salary in a place that cost us almost nothing to live. Yeah. And yeah. so from, uh, for, and, and it, and it looks really good on a resume. <laughs> <Yeah>. Sure. <laughs> Not for a year in, in Hungary. Uh, that sort of jumps off the page of people. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, the, the Hungarian people are very nice. There's a certain, um, there's a certain fineness to them, right. a certain gentility uh, to them. It's, it's, it's an interesting culture. It has its, its quirkiness. Mm. The school was, was a little bit topsy-turvy <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in, in many ways. But, uh, you know, it, it was a worthwhile experience, but not one we were eager to continue one year was enough. Yes. And, uh, and so we ended up in, in Atlanta, Georgia, where we taught there for a couple of years. And then I got a position in St. Louis, and I, I was, you know, been here ever since. And you're still teaching today? Well, not quite. Um, I taught in a school, a Jewish school here for 20 years. And in 2016, it closed down. Right. Um, uh, various political issues, which mm. unfortunately are too much part of our lives. Um, but 
at the same time, I, I was starting to feel I was coming to the end of the line. Okay. Uh, I've been teaching for 23 years. Uh, I loved it. But our education system has gotten so watered down mm. with the political correctness and the self-esteem philosophy, uh, parents that don't want their children to, to you know, have too much homework or, or, or don't want them to feel bad, right? You can't, the, the teacher can't grade in red ink because that's, that's hurtful when the when mm. their children see all these. I mean, you know, it's really gotten out of control. Yes. Um, and so I was thinking in terms, I'd really like to find something else to do. Right. Uh, so when the problem is you, you, you never jump until you have to. It That's was, right. Uh, I mean, there seems to be the timing in, you know, your journey and the travels and the kind of projects that have come about seems to be just amazing how this all kind of has unfolded. I find yeah. it fascinating. Yeah, and, and I think I, I really believe that 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 happens for all of us uh, because right. I can also I, I can look back on opportunities I wish I had taken. Of course, uh, we we come we come to forks in the road constantly. That's why I tell the story of that first night hitchhiking. Um, if if I would have have decided, you know, there's just too much. I'm going home. Mm. Uh, very likely we would not be having this conversation right now. That's right. Uh, I, I can't even imagine what my life would look like. Yeah. So one, you know, the decision of, of a few moments literally changed the course of my life yeah. and sent me in a direction I never would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So what happened next then? So the school closes and you felt that's about the right time for me. What am yeah, I going to do course. next? Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, it's, it's nice to have an income. Yes, and it's that, useful. That's, that's a, it's a useful thing. Uh, well, I, I had always, I've always loved speaking. I love words. I love writing. I love communicating. And, and uh, when you're in a classroom for 23 years with teenagers, uh, you develop uh, a certain ability to communicate uh, complex ideas. Yes, and I certainly have a lot of stories from uh, from my uh, from my my history. So, what I really thought was there are principles in Judaism that apply not just to us, but apply to the whole world. Uh, ideas that are not ostensibly theological, even though mm. they come from a, from a philosophy of theology. But if you could sum up all of the ideals, all of the mindset that comes from Judaism and put it into one word, what would that word be? I believe that word would be ethics. Right. right? Ethics is the, is the Discipline of recognizing and committing ourselves to what we ought to do. And it sounds like it should be easy, but we don't always know what we ought to do. And even when we know, there are lots of forces at play that are trying to get us to do other things and go in other directions. Yes. And so what I've done is I have crafted a presentation, or really a series of presentations in which I can demonstrate to people in the professional world, businesses, corporations, associations, leaders, management, and, uh, and uh, all professional people, how to recognize the benefit of ethics, why good ethics is good business, yes. why having a mindset of, of being an ethical person will really transform everything in our lives, our relationships, our jobs, our productivity, our organizations, our communities. The quality of life is so much better mm. when we all develop an ethical mindset. Uh, one, of the, one of the big problems I think we have, in, in, in certainly in the, in the United States today, is this hyper-focus on rights, everybody's rights. If I'm worried about my rights and you're worried about your rights, we are going to be butting heads constantly. Yes. I'm entitled to this. You're entitled to that. 
But if I'm focused, what's, what are my responsibilities to you? And you're focused. What are your responsibilities to me? We're never going to have any problems. No. We're going to work together with, a, with an attitude and, a, and an atmosphere of collegiality, of mutual respect, of civility, of cooperation, collaboration. We're going to get more done. We're going to make more money. We're going to have happier lives. We're not going to hate our jobs. We're not always going to be looking for the next the next good thing. It's you know the the benefits and and one of the ironies is it's so hard to sell the benefit of ethics to businesses. You know they want they want customer service. They want sales. They want marketing and and all that stuff's important. We live in the real world. But when you create when you look at look at corporations companies. That that are known for their their company culture. Are right? you familiar with Zappos, the shoe company? Um, Not they that have well. this. They have this incredible story. People love working for them. Trader Joe's is. Uh, do you have Trader Joe's in England? No. Nope. It's a it's a big grocery chain in 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 America here, and people love to work for them. Right. And people standing, bagging groceries, loving their job. <laughs> Because they love the culture of the company. And it's incredibly successful. You have happy employees, you have a successful company. You have happy workers, they're going to go home, they're going to have happy families. Yes. Because they're going to come home happy instead of coming home yeah. grum- grumbling and, and snorting and sneering and, and ready to bite somebody's head off because they've been holding it in all day at work. <laughs> but do they, do they have some sort of... Um equity share in the organization? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, some companies do. Mm. Um, I don't know about those two in particular. They have, they have excellent benefits. Yes. You know, when it comes to healthcare, and, and, and those are all things that are very important uh, here in America, where certainly our healthcare has been in crisis forever. That's right. Um, um, but you know, so when you, when you take care of your employees, um, if you've heard of Alcoa, the aluminum company, Yes. Um, they were in crisis back in the 70s and 80s, and they got a new CEO, and he made the top priority worker safety. And everybody thought he was nuts. How are you going to save the company with that? Yes. Well, when the workers began to see that the company was truly putting their best interests above the bottom line, mm. everything turned around. They, they, yeah. It, it's fascinating because, you know, and we we live in a capitalist capitalism society, where obviously the way that we're all structured with financial markets and shareholders, and you know, countries wanting to generate growth, GDP increases year on. Every single year, you know, we measure our success in countries, organizations, and in people by the amount of growth and success they can generate in terms of wealth. So it starts with the individual, how can I create the most wealth for myself? And then when you're in the organization, how can the organization generate the most wealth for themselves? And then it's the country. How can the country be number one in the world and create the most wealth for itself? And it's this constant pressure on everybody for growth, for wealth. To what end? You know, it really makes everybody sick at the end of the day. Um, the pressure and the, and the the emphasis on all of this. And then on top of that, you get the inequality of pay where the top of the organization, and this is really bad in the United Kingdom, where the top of the organization are being paid millions, if not billions, and the bottom of the organization is in poverty, where the disparity across the organization, which again makes people ill because of the stress and the you know, dissatisfaction of it all, and I don't know how, and I don't know if you're optimistic that there are signs where organizations are starting to change it. I would love 
to know, and we may not have time on this podcast, and we may need to do a second one, I don't know, but it's, I would love to know how companies can move to a different way of thinking where they are, you know, being more ethical towards their suppliers, their shareholders, their, and most of all their employees. If they put their employees first, then everybody else is going to benefit. Absolutely. And that's, see, that's, that's the problem. It's, it's the short-sightedness of immediate profits. Mm. Um, whereas if you take a long view, there, they've actually, there, there are studies that, that demonstrate that companies ranked highest for ethics actually increase in value faster, that employees are more engaged and therefore more productive and therefore profits go up. It's not a big jump of understanding. It's not a leap of faith. It's not, it's not, well, I have to, I have to forego my success in order to be an ethical person or create an ethical culture. It's just the opposite. Mm. When, when, when you, when you take care of people, when you show people their value, when you treat them fairly, I mean, unfairness. I just saw a TED talk on this. The, the, um, the, the corrosive effect of unfairness or perceived yeah. unfairness. You know, I have no problem with people getting rich. I mean, it's, it's, if somebody has a great idea and he, and he's a, and he has insight and innovation and, you know, professional savvy, let him get rich. It doesn't bother me that somebody has billions. What bothers me is if he got to get his billions by, by stepping on and crushing other people. Yes. Uh, of people that he exploited and didn't give a fair salary or didn't treat fairly uh, or just doesn't have the social responsibility to say, I've got more money than I could ever possibly need. Mm. Um, you know, Bill Gates is famous for his philanthropy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, he's doing some great stuff in the world. Yes. And there are, there are plenty of people. Uh, what was that statistic I heard recently? I forget the exact number. It was something like the, the, I think it was the, maybe the 15 or the 20 richest people in the world have as much money as I think it was the bottom two thirds of the population of the world. Mm, that's right. And that is just staggering. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I don't believe in socialism. I don't believe in, 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 um, what do they call it? Wealth redistribution by the government. Mm. Like the government typically does not do such a great job with these things. Um, yeah. but again, it goes with that idea. If, if I have more, it's interesting in Hebrew, the word for charity translates literally from the root of justice, not from kindness, not from mercy, not from compassion, from justice. Yes. Because, because the underlying assumption is, if I have more than I need, then it's only just that I share with those that don't have what they need. Yeah. And it shouldn't be something that should be mandated or, or controlled by the state. It should be part of the culture where I'm looking around me. I'm looking, how can I take what I have, take my blessings, and use them to improve the lives of others. It's fascinating. And, and how many organizations are you working with who are starting to embrace that kind of thinking? Well, I am uh, really just getting going uh, in, my, in my business. Mm. Uh, I, I've worked on the ideas, I've worked on the concepts, I've worked on the platform presentation. What is uh, the biggest challenge to me is marketing um, and, uh, and promoting, mm. uh, which is something I, I, never, I never thought I was going to be a businessman. I was a teacher my whole career. That's right, yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough learning curve. And, um, you know, fortunately, I found so, some mentors, but I've spoken to healthcare organizations. I've spoken to manufacturers. I've spoken to distributors. Um, 
I find that people in healthcare are particularly receptive to my message because paying people what they're worth in healthcare is a big problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're there, especially in, in, um, you know, care for the, for the, for the, uh, elderly. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, 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 it's so important. I mean, my father in the last years of his life, when he has had Alzheimer's, you know, he was completely dependent upon, upon the nurses and the caregivers. And these people are getting paid way below what they should be for the importance of their job. And the, the structure of the industry is such their, their profit margins are so narrow that they simply don't have the resources to pay people what they should be paying them. Yeah. And they don't know what to do about it. Um, so there are logistic problems that have to be addressed. But to create an environment where people at least feel valued, they feel appreciated, where they know that their bosses care about them and their well-being, there is a recent study that found that when they asked workers, what's the most important thing you want from a, from a boss or from a job? They said, a boss we can trust. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a huge, huge amount of mistrust in organizations between, well, it's right across the organization. It's, it's colleagues distrust each other. And then you've got a, you know, lower levels of the organization to the top levels. And then you've got it among senior people as well. They don't trust each other. And when, when that happens, there, it's, it's broken, you know, That's everybody, toxic. every, yeah. And everybody suffers. Including the bosses. Pardon? (laughs) Including the boss and the owner. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And they're the ones who who may have, you know, created it because they may often you see in in especially owner founders of organizations when they have to start employing people. um, Once they've run the organization on their own, now they're having to give away their money that they made to employees to make more money. Um, and they may not have the same values or the same oh, ethics. <laughs> yeah. You know, they haven't been recruited with the right ethics in mind and the values in mind to begin with. Absolutely. And you know, money is a great motivator. Uh, someone once said that you need gas to run a car. That's not the purpose of the car. The purpose of the car is not to, to burn gas. But without the gas, the car doesn't go anywhere. Yes. We need profit motivation. We all do. Uh, it's, it's no, nobody works, very few people work effectively when they're not driven by the, the need to support themselves. But that's, that can't be the goal. That's just a stepping stone in life. Yes. Uh, I, I, want, I want to support myself so I can, I can live a quality life. I can live a, a meaningful life. I can enjoy my family. I can enjoy my community. I can contribute in a positive way. So I need to be able to pay my bills. I need to have electricity and, and water and, and rent and food to be able to do those things. And, uh, and, and take vacations, fine. And if I can afford a nicer car, fine. And a bigger house, fine. Uh, but when we lose sight of the connection with people and and when we lose sight of those things that are intrinsically valuable and produce real happiness uh then we're really setting ourselves up for serious problems and then we see many of them and you know you mentioned you mentioned earlier am I, am I optimistic i don't know if i'm optimistic um but i'm hopeful uh, yeah. I think I think that there are many people who are having these kinds of conversations. Yes, that the 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 flame has not been extinguished yet, uh, and if if more people who can balance idealism and pragmatism, uh, because it's a tricky balance. Yes, and we and we live in a polarized world. I mean. Uh, in American politics, the right and left are farther apart than they've ever been. That's right. Uh, and to the point where they become caricatures on both sides. 
And my hope is that sooner or later, the there will there will there will coalesce a. I like to think of it as as uh, people ask me, "What am I politically?" I'm a, I'm a passionate moderate. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pro- mm-hmm. the problem with moderation is that moderates are often flaky. Well, you know, let's just sort of figure out where the middle is and go there. Yeah. Um, that doesn't work. You, you have to have principles. You have to know what you believe in and why. You have to be open to debate and discussion. This is one of the things, one of the most important lessons of, of Jewish history is you had these two great Torah academies. And they had very different value systems, very different views. I mean, within Judaism, one were idealists and one were pragmatists. And, and the history says that when they argued, when they debated in the study hall, they were so ferocious, it was as if they fought with swords and spears. Yes. But when they left the study hall, they were friends. They got on great. They married the sons and daughters to each other. It mm-hmm. never was personal. And they were always looking for the truth. And their debates and discussions continued to form Jewish practice and Jewish tradition to this day. Because it was all with the intent of finding the truth, of doing the right thing, of making society in the world as good as it can be. Yeah. And there has to be that back and forth that you said earlier. We have to meet people from other places, engage people who don't think the way we do. Yes. Because that's the only way we broaden ourselves. That's the only way we see ourselves as interconnected with, with people who are different from us. And that's how you create and preserve and maintain a successful and a healthy society. And with your new way of educating and you're still teaching, aren't you, effectively, but you're now doing it in corporate organizations. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so you have a, a, a formula that, you know, to help that kind of culture change or this new way of thinking, this business ethics. I think you call it eth- ethical affluence, which I love. <laughs> um, I, I can't say that I've heard that enough <laughs> or can see that written down enough. Um, how do you work with people um, well, to get my, this my implemented? Main, yeah, my, my main uh, style of presentation is a keynote speaker. Right. So if I can speak at conferences, conventions, uh, corporate meetings. Um, but, you know, as, as, as much as I would like to think that, that my ideas, my presentations are so compelling and so inspiring that, that people will simply, after an hour, pick up and change their lives. Um, that's just not reality. No. Uh, a one hour presentation by itself is, is unlikely to change the world uh, or even a small piece of the world. So ideally what I, what I like to do is then follow up with, with corporations. Um, we, we, we can have, um, I'm working on developing an, an ethical assessment tool. Right. Where, um, developing programs that can be implemented um, to to involve employees in cultivating their own ethical mindset, yes. create a, a sense of of community within any corporate structure. Uh, there needs follow up, of course, and, of course, and yeah, because, and there has to be a plan. Uh, yeah, because in, in any teaching, lecture, or talk, you will be able to move people to a different mindset temporarily for them to even go, actually, I need to learn more about this. I, actually, this makes complete sense to me, but how can we embrace it? How can we implement it? Because that's the biggest task people have. The biggest test is, okay, I buy into this new way of thinking and working, but how do we get everybody across the line at the same time? <laughs> yeah. Or, or what do I do now? Yeah, exactly. Well, fantastic. Jonas, I, I, I know we can talk and debate this for many hours because I, I love the topic. I think it's so necessary in this world today. I think you're onto something that could have massive influence definitely in your country but across the world um 
Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story and, and your journey to coming to this point. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased you're doing it, quite honestly. Um, if people want to learn more about how they can get started with you, where, where do they go? Well, if they can spell my name, uh, Jonas and Goldson, uh, that's my website. And also my company is Ethical Imperatives. Uh, which is the, take them to the same website. Uh, they can find me there. That's probably the best place to start. Uh, there are articles, there are videos. I've got, I've got a couple of books um, that, that discuss the ideas that we've talked about. And uh, of course, I'm on LinkedIn. I, I, I've just recently started on Instagram. Uh, I have a Twitter handle, but I don't really use it much. Uh, I haven't quite figured out what to do with Twitter yet. <laughs> but... Uh, those are, uh, you know, look me up online and, uh, you know, certainly if anybody wants to reach out and have a conversation, uh, I'm always eager to connect with new people. I think that's the way to go. And, um, I will share all of those links in the, in the notes as well. And I'd love to keep in touch and learn what else is happening in moving this forward. And, and looking forward to hearing some of the successes that you're having with, with organizations looking at a different way of working and moving this into, a, you know, however long it takes, it doesn't matter. Uh, we've got to move in this direction across the world. So I'm looking forward to it, Jonathan. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you so much. And it's been a real pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Do keep in touch. Absolutely. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 